Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am indebted to the Secretary for Justice for inviting me to participate in today's forum, uh, and I propose to share with you my thoughts on the sentencing regime created under the National Security Law of Hong Kong. Although it is over a year since the National Security Law was enacted, uh, nobody, of course, has yet been sentenced for an offence under it. Uh, and as the law contains provisions which are novel, their precise standing has therefore yet to be determined. And one striking feature of the law uh, is its deployment of minimum sentences, which is rare. When courts sentence offenders, they have to weigh up uh, numerous factors, uh, often competing. They need to decide uh, what things the sentence uh, needs to prioritize uh, and what not, although the more serious the offense, the less leeway they enjoy. If, for example, the offence involves a severe crime like armed robbery, syndicated corruption or child molestation, a sentence which marks the abhorrence of right-thinking members of the public will be unavoidable uh, and the impact of the mitigating factors will at most be minimal. A court may have no choice but to impose a severe sentence as a deterrent to others, uh, as this can help to prevent crime. But that is not the only way, of course, of preventing crime. Uh, and if an offender, particularly if young, can be reformed, this will also help to protect the community. In recent times, greater emphasis has been placed by both the legislature uh, and the courts on rehabilitative sentences, and a lenient sentence may turn an offender away from a life of crime. Sentencing, however, is rarely simple, uh, and some judges have been heard to say that in comparison with the sentencing of an offender, the trying uh, of him is easy. Now, although Hong Kong's uh, laws prescribe maximum sentences, uh, the courts, with very few exceptions, enjoy a wide discretion when sentencing offenders. Although an adult offender who's convicted uh, of uh, murder uh, faces mandatory life uh, imprisonment, and an adult offender convicted of unlawful possession of an offensive weapon in a public place faces mandatory uh, sentence of imprisonment, which may be long or short, uh, such sentences are rare. However, there are certainly offences for which the legislature has indicated the levels of sentencing it expects the courts to impose, uh, and the national security law is therefore uh, in good company. I'd like now to look at the tiered penalties uh, under Article 22. Uh, under this article, there are three penalty tiers in relation to the offence of subversion, uh, and these are also reflected, I may say, uh, in respect of other national security offences, uh, secession, uh, terrorism and collusion. Whereas a principal offender convicted of subversion will face imprisonment uh, of uh, between 12 years and life imprisonment, an active participant may be sentenced to anywhere between three and 10 years imprisonment, while other participants will be liable to a fixed term of not more than uh, three years imprisonment or else to short term detention or restriction, which leaves the door open to alternative sentences, including a lesser term of imprisonment, a detention center order, a training center order, a community service order or a reformatory school order, see Article 64. This means, therefore, that uh, the sentencing discretion of the courts in regard to national security uh, offences uh, is reduced uh, in comparison with many other types of crime, uh, and the use of tiered uh, penalties serves to underline the gravity with which the criminality is viewed. Although some commentators have asserted that the uh, tiered penalties uh, in the law uh, uh, in Article 22 and elsewhere in the law are alien to our criminal justice system, this is incorrect. Different penalties for the same offence already exist uh, in some other situations, for example, under the gambling ordinance. Whereas the offence of unlawful uh, gambling in a gambling establishment attracts a maximum sentence of three years, uh, three months imprisonment and a fine of $10,000 on a first conviction, this rises to six months imprisonment and a fine of 20,000 on a second conviction and to nine months imprisonment and a fine of $30,000 on a third conviction. Again, under the Firearms and Ammunitions Ordinance, someone who is convicted of possession of an imitation firearm is liable to two years imprisonment on a first conviction, although this rises to seven years imprisonment if within 10 years he or she commits uh, another such or a related offense. Now, the reason why mandatory sentencing is so rare is that the view has always been taken that sentencing is an art and not a science, and that in achieving a just outcome, the discretion of the trial courts should not be overly fettered. This means that they should, as far as possible, be free to adjust the sentence upwards or downwards, taking account of the aggravating and mitigating factors, 
and after having had regard to such things as the circumstances of the offender, the impact of the crime upon the victim, uh, and the prevalence of the offence, which may necessitate a sentence which will deter others. Of course, some offences are subject to sentencing guidelines issued by the uh, appellate courts, uh, and these obviously limit the discretion uh, of the trial courts. But even then, the Court of Appeal has been at pains to emphasise that guidelines are not straitjackets and that a judge or magistrate may depart from them for good reason. Let me now turn to secondary parties. Under the uh, general criminal law, secondary parties or accessories uh, are liable to be prosecuted and convicted of the same offence as that committed by the principal offender. This means that an aider, a better, counsellor or procurer is liable to be dealt with at trial uh, and punished in the same way as the principal offender. Although a secondary party whose culpability is below that of a principal offender may receive a lesser sentence, this is by no means a given, uh, and they would each face the same maximum penalty for the offence of which they have been convicted. However, under Article uh, 23 of the National Security Law uh, in relation to subversion, uh, and also under Article 21 in relation to secession, a different, more lenient uh, approach applies. If somebody incites, assists in, abets, or provides a pecuniary or other financial uh, assistance or property for the commission of the offence uh, of subversion under Article 22, then he or she is guilty of an offence, although the sentence is not aligned to that of the principal. In the if, if, in, if the circumstances of the offence are of a serious nature, the offender will face a sentence of imprisonment of between five and ten years. But if the circumstances are of a minor nature, the offender will face imprisonment of up to five years or else short-term detention or restriction. On the face of it, therefore, the national security law has introduced a sensing approach for, sen for secondary parties convicted of uh, national security offences, which is milder than that which exists in relation to other types of accessories under the general law. The secondary party and the principal no longer face the same maximum sentence, uh, and a world of uh, difference therefore now exists in terms of their possible punishments. This, I may say, is not easy to rationalise, particularly as, for example, the culpability of a secondary party who incites the commission of the offence will sometimes be on a par with that of the principal who actually executes it. That the NSL has uh, moderated the penalties uh, imposable on secondary parties in this way is perhaps surprising, uh, given its objectives, but the wording is clear uh, and leaves no room for misunderstanding. Let me now turn to the categories of offender. Uh, under Article 22, I would like to deal with this issue as it may prove to be challenging. The national security law does not, like, does not, unlike many local laws, contain an interpretation section at its outset, and the meaning of the terms used in Article 22 to describe the culpability of the three types of uh, offenders, namely principal offender, active participant, uh, and other participant, will therefore need to be resolved by the courts in due course. And their determinations will be crucial and will affect the sentencing band under which the offender is to be punished. A mastermind of the subversive activity or a leader on the ground will undoubtedly be a principal offender, uh, while culprits who assume non-leadership roles, such as facilitating the crime or providing backup, uh, uh, will presumably fall into the category of active participant. As regards the class of miscreant, uh, referred to as other participants, this pres presumably covers peripheral figures, uh, perhaps operating on the sidelines to assist the offence uh, in a less than significant way. Since the actual sentence to be imposed on the offender depends so much on the label attached to his or her culpability, the courts will undoubtedly face legal arguments uh, on the issue uh, and they will be required to make rulings. In some ways, uh, this may, in some cases, this may not be easy, where the criminality in question is on the borderline between two distinct uh, uh, categories uh, and the degree of culpability is disputed. And this means, therefore, that prosecutors must be in a position to categorize the criminality of each defendant in advance of trial and then to satisfy the court by evidence as to the legitimacy of their various categorizations. This is a new situation, clearly, uh, and everybody involved will need to prepare themselves. Let me now turn to mandatory sentencing and judicial discretion. Only one case has arisen so far in which sentencing under the national security law has been judicially considered, uh, and that occurred when the accused person argued in the High Court 
in a habeas uh, corpus application arising out of a, a refusal of bail that mandatory sentences of imprisonment neutralized the exercise of independent judicial discretion. This submission received short shrift, with the judges pointing out that as a matter of principle, it is not objectionable for the legislature to prescribe a fixed uh, punishment, such as life imprisonment for murder, or a range of sentences, including a maximum uh, and minimum sentence for a particular offense, leaving it to the judge to determine the appropriate sentence on the facts of the case. The National Security Law Offence provisions, they ruled, only prescribed the range of sentences for convicted persons and not the actual penalty to be imposed. And this meant that there was no impermissible interference with the exercise of judicial powers in Hong Kong. Indeed, mandatory minimum sentences are by no means unknown elsewhere in the common law world, uh, and they may perform a useful function. They can and do provide a potent deterrent to those who are contemplating a crime, uh, and this is an important consideration when the crime in question is becoming prevalent in a particular jurisdiction. In Australia, for example, the federal parliament has recently adopted a minimum sentence of six years imprisonment uh, for sex offenders who abuse children overseas. In Canada, some of its firearms offences are punishable with a minimum sentence of four years imprisonment. So it could be seen, therefore, that uh, minimum sentences contained in the national security law, while not common in our domestic law, are by no means out of step with the sentencing patterns which have emerged in some other common law jurisdictions. May I now turn to the issue of mitigation uh, under Article 33. After a suspect uh, has been convicted, mitigation invariably plays a, a role in determining the sentence. However, the more serious the offence, the less likely its impact is likely to be. What is and is not relevant to mitigation has been determined by the courts in numerous judgments uh, and these indicate the extent to which reliance can be placed upon particular factors. What, however, is unusual, if not unprecedented, is for a particular law to incorporate specific mitigating factors for the sentencing court to consider, uh, even though uh, aggravating factors have sometimes been included, notably under the road traffic ordinance. However, Article 23 of the National Security Law contains a novel provision by which the trial court may impose a lighter penalty or the penalty may be reduced, or in the case of a minor offence, exempted, uh, in three situations. These arise, firstly, uh, if the accused person has, during the commission of the offence, voluntarily discontinued uh, his or her involvement, or effectively foresaw its consequences. Secondly, uh, if the accused person has voluntarily surrendered himself or herself and given a truthful account of the offence. Or thirdly, if the accused person has reported an offence uh, committed by others, or provided information which assists the authorities in solving another criminal offence. Now, although the difference between a lighter penalty on the one hand and the penalty for the offence being reduced on the other uh, is not explained, uh, the drafters obviously saw this uh, as uh, saw a real distinction between the two. As regards the lighter penalty, this apparently refers to a lower sentence within the specified tier. So, using subversion as an example, uh, if a court decides to take 10 years imprisonment, which is the maximum for an active participant in subversion, as the starting point for sentence, this may be lowered uh, if any one of those three mitigating factors is present. What, however, is unclear is whether it could be further reduced for other mitigating factors, such as a clear record, old age or mental disorder. And it is certainly arguable that it cannot, given that the drafters have only singled out three factors as a basis for sentence reduction. I suspect, however, that the courts will try to find a way of ensuring that other mitigating factors can still be taken into account when a lighter penalty is imposed, albeit to a lesser extent. Perhaps by holding, the effect of Article 33 is to require that greater emphasis is placed upon the three factors it highlights without wholly excluding the others. The effect of Article 33 on other forms of uh, mitigation will need to be determined. Uh, and if, this, uh, if the courts find this problematic, uh, an interpretation by the Standing Committee of the NPC, as contemplated by Article 65, uh, may be necessary. Turning to the reduced penalty, this apparently refers to a penalty below the minimum sentence specified in the tier. So, for example, in a case where the minimum sentence for an active participation participant in subversion is three years imprisonment, the presence of any of those three mitigating factors will provide the court with a discretion to reduce the sentence to below three years. 
This seems to suggest, therefore, that other mitigating factors cannot also reduce the sentence below three years and should therefore be disregarded. Turning finally to the exempted penalty uh, under Article 33, uh, one of the other issues that does arise concerns the provision that if the offence uh, is minor in nature, the penalty may be exempted if any of the three mitigating factors which I have described are present. This presumably means that the court, having found the accused person guilty, can then impose no sentence at all on him or her. The immediate problem with this, however, is that it apparently conflicts with the long established principle that a conviction comprises of two elements namely a finding of guilt plus a sentence. If therefore an accused person has not been sentenced uh, uh, for an offence of which he or she has been adjudged uh, guilty, certain consequences inevitably follow. There is, for example, no conviction to enter on his criminal record. He has no prior conviction to reveal when he seeks employment and he cannot plead or to far convict uh, if he were to be charged again with the same offence. But there may, however, I suggest, be a way around this dilemma, and it involves the use of the absolute discharge. Uh, if the Article 33 exemption from penalty is equated by the courts with an absolute discharge, it may be possible to rationalise it within the existing sentencing framework. An absolute discharge, notwithstanding its uh, lack of uh, punitive impact, nonetheless ranks as a sentence in its own right. An absolute discharge, though comparatively rare, is imposed in circumstances where the court concludes that no actual penalty is necessary. This generally arises if the offence is trivial uh, or is otherwise uh, devoid of moral culpability, uh, as with some strict liability offences, but there seems to be no legal reason uh, why it cannot also be deployed in the situation contemplated by Article 33, when the, offense, uh, when the penalty for a minor offence uh, is exempted. Now, in conclusion, only time will tell if my thoughts on the national security law sentencing regime reflects the stances the courts will adopt in their adjudications, and there is certainly room for different interpretations. If some of the unresolved issues I have touched upon turn out not to pose any difficulty in practice, it will certainly be a great relief. Although the national security law sentencing regime is clearly tough, it also seeks to gauge degrees of culpability uh, and to punish offenders according to their actual criminality, which they at least will find reassuring. And once the new sentencing regime is fully functional, it will hopefully make Hong Kong a safer uh, and therefore a happier place in which to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Koss.